from the studios of Postscript Media and Canary Media. Miles O'Brien has been a broadcast journalist for 40 years. He's a former anchor at CNN. He's covered a wide range of stories across science, aviation, terrorism, hurricanes, technology. And many of his big stories in those areas often focused on disasters. The Columbia shuttle disintegration, Hurricane Katrina, the missing plane MH370, and the looming threat of climate change. And he felt like he needed a shift. After years and years of reporting on climate and the climate crisis and telling people about the impending doom that we all worry about, I really wanted to get to uh, a point where we could give people an idea that there are solutions. Today, Miles is the science correspondent for the PBS NewsHour, and over more than a dozen years in that job, he's become increasingly focused on a different kind of crisis reporting. Well, we um, are in a solutions crisis as well as a climate crisis, and, and the solutions are there, but uh, the crisis is that people don't know about them. That shift toward solutions culminated in a new documentary project for NOVA he's been working on for the last year called Chasing Carbon Zero. What would it take to convert our technology and reach a once unimaginable goal? We are at a critical point in our history right now. Zero carbon by 2050. So what do we need to do to actually meet that goal? It's all about the stuff that is ready right now to tackle climate change and how we actually build it. No technological breakthroughs required. We just have to get down to business right away. Chasing Carbon Zero, right now on NOVA. It is a very refreshing piece of broadcast journalism. It's probably the best account I've ever seen of the energy transition on television. And it reflects a transition for miles, too. It's come to the point now where this is, these are like the only stories that really inter interest me at this stage of my career. I really want to um, give people an idea of what's really on the shelf and just needs to be deployed in order for us to move the needle. So in this episode, we're going to spend some time on one of the stories that Miles uncovered during his reporting for that series, which brought him to the Eden Hall campus of Chatham University just outside Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It's a completely sustainable campus. It has, you know, lots of solar, has geothermal, they, they grow their own food, they raise their own fish. It's almost entirely its own little ecosystem. And then in the middle of that is uh, the dining hall. And that's where he met a guy named Chris Galarza. He's the executive chef there. And at the time he got the job, he was just a chef who was interested in working at this unusual campus. And... Uh, found his way into the world of induction cooking, and, and the rest is history for him. So talk more about Chris Galarza. What makes him unique in the culinary world? He's such an interesting story. He grew up poor in New Jersey, homeless for a time, and he learned how to cook in the context of not knowing exactly where the next meal was coming from. So it fuels that fire, pun intended, in like within you to push harder than anybody else, to show up two, three hours before your shift, to leave well after everybody else, to do more, learn more, to, to just become a sponge. He's, he's a very talented chef, obviously, and he ended up in some very high-end kitchens. And uh, that led him eventually to Carnegie Mellon University, where he was uh, the chef there. He enjoyed the campus setting, and that led him to Chatham. Chatham was building this new campus and new kitchen, and he decided to take that opportunity. And that put him on the, on the road to thinking about sustainability in a way I don't think he had before. The world had never seen a campus built from the ground up like this be fully self-sustained. We had our own farm. We had our geothermal systems. We created our own energy. We captured water. We tapped trees for maple syrup. We, I, I, I had my own trout. So. Sustainability to me is take, is giving back as much as you take. So what we're doing here on the campus is doing just that and showing the, the whole world you can do this in a, at the largest scale possible and be successful at it. You get to his kitchen, you walk in, what do you see and experience there? Well, have you spent much time in a commercial kitchen? Uh, once or twice, and it was very hot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for those of you who've never had the opportunity 
to go into a real commercial kitchen at a restaurant. It is, it is truly hell. First, what you notice is as soon as you open the door, going from, say, the dining room to the kitchen, is this wall of heat and humidity. You know, the temperatures are well above 100 degrees. You know, the, there's flames everywhere. It's loud. It's, it's really a crazy environment. And you got to wonder how people, you know, do a job there. I have looked down on my thermometer, like the, I would have a, sh- like a thermometer in my chef coat, and it would read 135 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, what does that do to your body? You get sick. So I can't tell you how many times that after a rush, we would be rushing to the bathroom to throw up. And you go into this kitchen, first of all, it's about 72 degrees, and it's just quiet. This is our four burner range. Right? There's two of them. This is the workhorse of the kitchen. This is now the tilt skillet, also induction. Two steamers, two electric convection oven, triple deck oven with two built-in proofers for breads, pizzas, pastries, and things like that. Instead of yelling uh, over the din of these huge exhaust fans and the flames and all the, the stuff, people were just having normal conversations. So it was night and day, and there wasn't a single flame burning in this kitchen. What Miles saw is more common in other parts of the world, but still a rarity in America, a fully electric commercial kitchen. And Chris Galarza sees it as the leading edge of a generational culinary change. The last hundred years, we've gone from horse and buggy to space travel. Our cell phones are more powerful than the entire NASA space program was when we went to the moon. We're capable of embracing change at a rapid pace. This is The Carbon Copy. I'm Stephen Lacey. This week, we tell the story of one chef's quest to bring induction cooking to commercial and industrial kitchens around the country. And then, in the second half of the episode, we'll take a step back and talk with Miles O'Brien about some bigger shifts in broadcast journalism around how to tell the climate story. And that story is coming right up. The Carbon Copy is brought to you by SunGrow. For over 25 years, SunGrow has been delivering PV inverter solutions around the world. Now in more than 150 countries, SunGrow's solutions include inverters for utility scale and commercial industrial solar and energy storage systems. Backed by a dynamic technical R&D team and an in-house testing center, SunGrow is committed to clean power for all. Learn more at us.sungrowpower.com. The Carbon Copy is supported by Fish Tank PR, a public relations, strategic messaging, thought leadership, and social media agency dedicated to elevating the work of early stage and established companies that are taking on some of the most pressing climate and energy challenges of our time. From making sure your next announcement is heard to helping find relevant industry events to tell your story, Fish Tank PR is here to help you. To learn more about Fish Tank's approach to clean tech and their services, visit fishtankpr.com. That's F-I-S-C-H-P-R.com. We'll link to it in the show notes. I want to tell you about another podcast from LAist Studios called The Big Burn. As the world enters a new age of wildfires, science reporter Jacob Margolis dives deep into the personal stories that illuminate the history of how we got here, why we keep screwing things up, and what we can do to survive and maybe even thrive while the world continues to burn around us. Again, it's called The Big Burn from LAist Studios, and you can find it wherever you get your podcasts. So the focus for kitchen electrification often centers on the home kitchen, but there's this massive electrification opportunity in large industrial or commercial kitchens, restaurants, universities, hospitals, office buildings. How big is this opportunity and why are we missing it? So here's the thing. You know, you go to New York, for example, which has all the local laws which are aimed at, you know, eliminating burning of fossil fuels inside buildings over the next, uh, over the coming years. But there's a carve out for commercial kitchens. Uh, the restaurant industry, the lobby, has successfully persuaded politicians that it's a bad idea because it would um, hurt a very important industry in a place like New York City. Now, some places, Berkeley, California, is an example, have decided to go this route. And there's tremendous pushback from the chefs who are just like hanging on to their their gas stoves, you know, take it from my cold, dead hand kind of approach. And some of this is just, you know, hidebound tradition. This is just the way we've done it. 
At pretty much every point in this complicated and messy energy transition, there are institutions resistant to change until they embrace it or they're forced to shift. Utilities, automakers, commercial building operators, maybe someday oil and gas majors. You can put the culinary industry into that category too. And Miles visited Chris to ask why so many chefs cling to lighting a flame over healthier, cooler, quieter electric kitchens. It's interesting, though, when you talk to a lot of professionals in this industry, old school maybe, that sounds pejorative, but somewhat, yeah, they're going to tell you I, it's gas or nothing for me. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm a pro, and that's how I control it. Um, right. is, that's pretty common, isn't it? Absolutely. You probably felt that way, too. I, before I got here, 100%. The truth is we can look back in history and see the same things being said. So back in the early 1900s, late 1800s, there was a push to kind of get rid of coal out of the kitchen and, and introduce natural gas. And the chefs was, were saying, listen, natural gas sounds cool, but it's an untested, proven, it's an unproven technology. The natural gas industry said, hey, but we're going to reduce the, the, the emissions coming off your kitchen. We're going to improve air quality. We're going to improve the temperature of the kitchen. We're going to make it more comfortable. We're going to give you more consistency. We're going to give you all these things that would just benefit you. Eventually, obviously, the natural gas won. And rightfully so. It was a much better way of cooking. But now, 100 years later, nearly to the, to the year, we're having the exact same conversations and saying, listen, with, it, with induction cooking, we can reduce the temperature of your kitchen. We can increase productivity. We can increase uh, thermal comfortability. We can, we can clean up the air, reduce emissions, all these things. And now these chefs are saying, but this is tradition. This is how we've always cooked, right? So I tell folks like that, that cooking is not about your fuel source. It's about fundamentals and technique. Uncouple yourself from your own biases. Do your due diligence and try to experience induction cooking for yourself. I had my own biases as well, and it wasn't until I did that that I became a fan. And this isn't a new concept. In fact, every international culinary competition in the world is electric. That includes the Boku's Door, the Culinary Olympics. So the best chefs in the world cook on induction. There's also this economic benefit that seems kind of similar to uh, electric vehicles and that the upfront cost of an electric vehicle is higher than a conventional vehicle, but your maintenance costs are lower over time. Uh, the drivetrain is a lot simpler, and so your maintenance costs are a lot lower. And in an in induction kitchen, you're not cleaning as much, so the amount of time that people are spending cleaning these um, these cooktops is, is lower. You're the, the health of people in the kitchen is better, and you also uh, get rid of the need for the more sophisticated and louder venting system. There are all these things that potentially could add up. How did Chris think about those economic benefits? Yes, he he discovered them by this happy accident of ending up being a pioneer in an induction-driven kitchen on a college campus. And and you're right. You know, these these vent hoods that you see in these commercial kitchens, these are hundreds of thousands of dollars, and you have to have a certain amount of throughput to be safe around all that fire. Uh, and uh, when you have induction, you need much less uh, exhaust capability, much less expense. It, it takes... Uh, you know, if you're really good, it takes 20, 30 minutes to clean a commercial broiler top after um, a night of cooking because all the stuff gets, you know, baked on. And there are all kinds of chemical solvents that they have to use, huge expense there. And, of course, with induction, you just kind of, you know, soap and water wipe it off in, in about 30 seconds. So those are the things that you have to explain to restaurant owners and chefs because when they look at the, uh, you know, just like the electric car, when you look at the initial price, you get a little bit of sticker shock. Uh, but when you start, you know, realizing the cost down the road, you know, either in true dollars, but certainly in the long-term health uh, of kitchen workers, of, of chefs and their their support, it's got to be better. So now you're seeing that you can get more food cooked with your, with your staff, less time cleaning, more time for production, less chemical costs. And in an industry where we're seeing it incredibly hard to find staff, how is it not a win-win, right? It just makes sense. Like, the analysis is there. It's better for your kitchen. One of the reasons why I think this story is so compelling is because you have this technology that, for many who use it, 
is just obviously better than lighting a flame. And uh, so many people who in uh, residential kitchens or in commercial kitchens who actually use induction cooking are become hardcore evangelists and realize that it is a superior <laughs> technology. It's like cooking with an iPhone. But you are, we run into- That's a great analogy. <laughs> it really is. And I live with what my, my partner, Susie, she is like, she's become a complete evangelizer. She, she, she won't stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> but you run into resistance because of the stories we tell ourselves. And some of, uh, you know, a lot of chefs just think that flames are superior. And much of that thinking comes from the gas industry marketing, decades and decades of marketing. And many of the ways that people talk about gas are pulled from the marketing language that the gas industry has used. And they have also done a good job of pushing back on some of the regulations. So what to you is the friction point in this story, if we do have a superior technology? You know, I think you you nailed it. I mean, <laughs> listen, uh, you've seen the, the bad rap, literally, uh, cooking with gas. Cooking with gas. gas. Cooking with gas. gas. We all cook better when we're cooking with gas. gas. I can't believe this is still going on. <laughs> How much more we got? I don't know. Oh, yeah. Oh, we're I, halfway. Oh, no, no, stop. I can't do any more. <coughs> we're only so, halfway. I, I, I well, There's I, a lot to unpack there. I believe, I, yeah, there's so much, but I believe I characterized it as a good PR campaign, <laughs> and then I watched that. <laughs> but you know what? That was effective. That was very effective, because that, what was said in there, still gets said today. Cooking with gas is cheaper. It's more precise. All these things, which are, which are just not true. You know, it's easy to make fun of, uh, and we laugh at it. And we, you know, in a sense, when you watch that thing from the 1980s, you wonder how we were persuaded by it. But it's it is indicative of the fact that this is just, if you'll excuse the pun, it is baked into our view of the world, right? And it's been a very successful, long running propaganda campaign. And I don't think we realize how much we are enmeshed in that. But, you know, that's like how we thought about internal combustion cars not too long ago versus electric vehicles. Suddenly things flipped, right? And now we're, we're moving into the mass market phase. What's interesting about induction is we're seeing uh, exactly what you say. People who have the experience using them become, they, they won't stop talking about it. And there's, uh, as Chris pointed out, he said this might be the first time that uh, a technology change in the kitchen is driven at home as opposed to in the professional kitchen. What we're going to see is a dynamic shift in which we've never seen before, which the residential chef is going to influence the commercial chef for the first time. Because the residential market is picking this up a lot faster. People are buying these things and telling their friends about them. And they're taking it all faster than they are at the restaurant you go and have a meal at. So I, I think there might be some momentum there at, at the grassroots, maybe not unlike other transitions we have, have witnessed recently. Who's winning the, 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 the public debate right now? Do you sort of feel like you're up against a, a tsunami of uh, opposition at 100%. this point, or is it changing? We're definitely up against the tsunami, as you said, uh, because they're putting money towards influencers to put forth a social media marketing campaign to say, hey, cooking with gas is so much better. Uh, but we have all the data to show it's not. So we, like, I'm not flush with cash, right? Where I'm just a small business and I'm going up against these guys. I have a great team and I work with a lot of great folks who put together these messaging. And still, I think we're winning. Why are we winning? Well, we, in three years, started with Berkeley saying, hey, we should, you know, really look into our built environment and clean up what we're doing. And three years later, we have 82 cities that have followed in suit. That's affecting about 32 million Americans. That's a, that's a tenth of the country in three years. And for folks who are really nervous about making that switch, take a look around for a second. Go into your kitchen. How many things are gas? Probably one. It's not a big leap. Everything around you is electric.
Support for the Carbon Copy comes from SunGrow. For over a quarter century, SunGrow has been providing reliable and cost-effective solutions for the solar industry. SunGrow inverters provide efficient and reliable power generation to maximize your return. With SunGrow's expansive product line, you can trust that your system will perform at its best day in, day out. Not only has Bloomberg New Energy Finance rated them as the world's most bankable inverter, but 40% of SunGrow's employees are dedicated to R&D, ensuring that products are always at the forefront of the industry. SunGrow has over 340 gigawatts installed globally across 150 countries. From utility scale and CNI solutions to energy storage, SunGrow is committed to providing clean power for all. Learn more at us.sungrowpower.com. The Carbon Copy is supported by Fish Tank PR, a public relations, strategic messaging, thought leadership, and social media agency dedicated to elevating the work of early stage and established companies that are solving some of the most pressing climate and energy challenges of our time. Fish Tank's approach to working with clients is focused on leveraging deep industry and media expertise and relationships to craft compelling narratives that resonate with journalists as well as investors, customers, and talent recruitment. You can think of Fish Tank as an extension of your own team, from making sure your news is heard to helping find events where you can tell your story, Fish Tank PR is here to help you. They help translate complex ideas and technologies into tangible, compelling content that resonates with your target audiences, so you can stay focused on bringing technology at scale to market. To learn more about Fish Tank's approach to clean tech and their services, visit fishtankpr.com. That's F-I-S-C-H, tankpr.com, and you can find the link in the show notes. Hey, Carbon Copy listeners. I want to tell you about another podcast that explores our relationship with the natural world. Threshold is a Peabody award-winning podcast that takes you on immersive journeys to fascinating parts of the planet. On Threshold, you'll get up close and personal with American bison, camp out on the Greenland ice sheet, meet the people who call the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge home, and go inside the effort to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. It's storytelling at the intersection of science, politics, culture, and environmental justice. Take a deep dive into some of the most interesting environmental issues of our time with Threshold. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now, one of the reasons why I was so eager to talk with Miles is that his approach to telling the climate solutions story in this new documentary is still kind of novel in television journalism. I've spent the last 17 years covering the on the ground transition that's finally gaining momentum in a way that people can't ignore. And I always saw this extreme disconnect between what was actually advancing in business and technology and the way it was being covered or not covered at all. And in television news, where reporters rush from disaster to disaster with little context or just put everything in a political context, climate reporting still really sucks, frankly. And so I spent some time talking with Miles about how he shifted his reporting since his time at CNN. Well, I think we've all changed, for one thing, but... You know, what kind of, I I feel like the journalistic process has gone through, you know, the stages, so to speak. You know, first it was denial, then it was bargaining, and maybe now we're kind of at acceptance, right? And and that's where we all are, I think, about the climate problem. And I think, uh, I, I like to think that journalism is appreciating this and evolving uh, and transitioning its coverage into a more solution-driven narrative. Yeah, you know, when I first started covering it, I mean, I had to spend so much time just, you know, trying to convince editors at CNN that um, it is not uh, equivalent to give equal time between the IPCC and, uh, you know, a spokesman for the Cato Institute, you know, uh, who is, you know, funded by the fossil fuel industry. That, that is a false equivalence and does not lead anybody to a greater understanding or to anywhere close to what the truth might be. And But it was very difficult to get journalists at that time, this is in the 90s, to understand that covering science and particularly the climate through the prism of a, a political reporting, which is, you know, well, if you get the Republican, you got to get the Democrat, and on the one hand, on the other hand, kind of stuff, that that kind of reporting ultimately is wildly inaccurate and gives people all the wrong impressions. So I spent a lot of time just kind of fighting those battles, and that got better over time. On top of that, frankly, Stephen, we, we finally had, sadly, but it did help, frankly, in the television world, we had things to point the camera at. 
whether it's you know uh, epic flooding or fl- um, wildfires or any of the consequences that unfortunately are very real and very present to people now, that has catalyzed people's attention and maybe you know awaken them and given us frankly a, a better way of telling our stories because we can say hey look at this is because we have science to connect the dots so then the next step is okay we're, we're as we make our evolution we ha- I feel completely compelled to tell people that there are ways to address this and you know every time I was with a scientist talking about these, these various issues, they're, they're be, you know, like scratching their heads saying it's, it's too bad because we're really not waiting for a breakthrough here. We can, we can do this if we just start deploying what we have on the shelf. What we lack is leadership. And so that's when I decided I, I've just got to push as hard as I can in this direction. And I'm a boomer. I was taught journalism uh, in an era, a little different era, where you know the idea was that um, – Viewers aren't necessarily interested in, you know, in solutions, just, you know, kind of drop a problem bomb in the public square, light the fuse and run away, right? And the solutions be damned. And um, I had the good fortune to be hired as a science correspondent at CNN. So I I spent my, you know, huge number of years in laboratories talking to people who are looking at problems through the prism of how to solve them. And so I, I really feel compelled to spend whatever energy I have left as a reporter on this planet trying to show people what can be done, what are the options, how can we uh, address the, the, the problem, how can we diffuse the problem bomb in the public square. So what I see is an evolution in print outlets more so in broadcast. I think a lot of print outlets are bringing in real estate reporters, business reporters, culture reporters into the climate story. And in some of the top outlets, some of that coverage is evolving. In I want to get your opinion on broadcast journalism and, and, and how this is evolving, because I, I call it drive-by climate journalism. You know, there there is more to point the camera at now, but still I see a lot of people swooping in to cover a disaster and then swooping out. There's also still a problem with a lot of broadcast news coverage. I, I think Media Matters, which is a progressive media watchdog, says only a, a 1% of corporate broadcast news coverage was devoted to climate in 2022. And a lot of that coverage comes from Sunday morning talk shows where it's still kind of framed as a political debate. So you have this problem, and this is not the way that you're talking about it on PBS NewsHour, but it still is a broadcast industry issue. What do you think the impact of that style of coverage is? And and do you see any meaningful shifts across the broadcast landscape other than what you're specifically focused on? Well, it's a, it's a tough problem because if you look at how the, the cable enterprises have changed the way we cover things. You, you basically, everything becomes a political story uh, because that's that's their stock and trade, right? That's how they keep the the, the eyeballs attached to twenty uh, four hour cable. Let's take the pandemic for an example. The pandemic was kind of covered out of the White House press room, right? The, you know, which is crazy, right? The, the, there there weren't, you know, the the, the broadcast networks, uh, except for the PBS NewsHour, frankly don't have dedicated science reporters anymore. They have health, you know, health and medicine. Uh, CNN does now have an environmentally focused uh, correspondent, Bill Weir, who does a lot of climate stuff. But they really, you know, when when I was at CNN, uh, up until the day we all got our, our pink slip in 2008, there were eight of us who are devoted to science and covering science and trying to push that kind of uh, coverage on the air. That we, in other words, we were allowed to be subject matter experts, and that has gone. And that's why you get, you know, generalists and mostly political reporters covering the climate. And and of course, you know, if, if you know that that expression, if if uh, if you got a hammer, the whole world's a nail. Every story they see, they see through the, that political prism, and that is a huge, huge disservice to what we've just been talking about, because it does become a tit for tat. On the one hand, on the other hand, journalism, which is not understanding the nuance of the science or the possibilities of the solutions, and and that requires, frankly, a little more effort, a little more time. Uh, in the field and on the air to do it right. And I am fortunate working for 
the PBS NewsHour to have, you know, eight, 10 minutes magazine length stories instead of, you know, two minute drive-bys as, as you put it. And if that Media Matters survey, I will point out uh, the PBS NewsHour is right at the top as far as the am- the amount of climate coverage. We've really pushed very hard there. And our v- I'm telling you, there is an appetite. People lap this stuff up. Anytime I put any sort of climate and climate solution story on the website, on YouTube, we get huge number of viewings. So there is an appetite for this. People want to watch this. The cable enterprises haven't figured that out or don't want to spend the money or are too focused on Trump tweets or whatever. But uh, if you really want to get that kind of coverage, you have to find it elsewhere, unfortunately. And how do you think about climate disaster reporting? Because this is inevitably a part of the beat. It's the You have solutions, but we also have more climate disasters, they're increasing in frequency and intensity. And so you need to go to places where people's lives and communities are being impacted. What's the most helpful way that we can do that so it doesn't feel like you're just swooping in and out and you're providing context? There are a lot of outlets that are just afraid to talk about it in a climate context, too, because behind the scenes, you suddenly have this extraordinary advancement in attribution science, where we can actually say fairly close to an event that an event was statistically more likely because of human-caused climate change. And still a lot of outlets are afraid to talk about extreme weather events in a climate context. So how do you think about showing up to a place, reporting on a disaster, and putting the climate context in a helpful way into a story? Yeah, I think uh, a couple of things. First of all, sometimes it's better to uh, wait a few days, frankly, and let the dust settle so you can say something more definitive about things. We do have a lot of scientific water behind the dam now, though, so we can, you know, say even when even when you're getting blown off the roof doing the reporting, you can say that you know scientists have connected the dots on you know hurricanes being uh, greater in strength and and you know the the amount of moisture in the air makes them wetter. Those those things can be said, but it's really important to follow up on these things, and that's what we don't, you know, collectively don't do well in the world of uh, broadcast journalism. You know, again, it it it's, goes back to that, you know, the the problem bomb idea. It's like let's let's you know, the the problem is good for ratings. The solution, oh, that's boring, or as you say, it's an activist thing, or whatever the case may be. But as the science has grown, it's easier to pitch and sell those stories. One thing I think we should point out is the evolution of TV meteorologists. This is a key thing. So for a very long time uh, in our country, TV meteorologists were outright denialists when it came to climate change. Uh, uh, 50 plus, I, it was up close to 60% uh, just a few years ago. And that has a lot to do with, frankly, how they got taught at School. Uh, they also, frankly, all revered John Coleman, the the Weather Channel founder, who was a famous climate denialist. So there were there were a lot of reasons why this happened, uh, but uh, that has changed. Groups like Climate Central have helped do this uh, by providing them uh, information on the the latest science, helping them connect the dots, helping them stay current on what's out there, and providing, frankly animations and video packages that they can incorporate into their uh, weathercasts. And so th- what you get now from um, TV meteorologists, who are, frankly, probably the only scientist any person has ever put a, a face with, uh, and and somebody that uh, an individual watching at home trusts, you're getting a steady diet now of, this is a crazy heat wave. And let me tell you about heat waves and the climate. And that's happening more and more. And that, I think, that really can move the needle if, if that is constantly kind of part of the message on a day-to-day basis. Miles O'Brien is the science correspondent for PBS NewsHour. He's the host, producer, and writer of the new uh, documentary called Chasing Carbon Zero. Remind us again where we can find it. All right, this will premiere on Nova. Check your local listings, April 26th. But then it, you know, the great thing about PBS is it'll, it has a nice long tail. It'll be out there on YouTube, on the PBS site, uh, pretty much forever and uh, not behind a paywall. So, and uh, just remember us uh, once a year and we'll send you a tote bag. It gets two thumbs up from me. Really nice work. I loved it a lot. And I think our listeners will like it too. Thanks, Miles. 
Well, that is high praise, Stephen, and I appreciate that, and I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk to me today. Well, that is it for the show. The Carbon Copy is a co-production of Postscript Media and Canary Media. This episode was produced by me with support from Dalvin Abouage. Go to postscriptmedia.com to sign up for our newsletter and get all our releases, and go to canarymedia.com for all the news on the clean energy transition. Uh, thanks to Sean Marquan, who's our engineer and the person who wrote our theme song. Original music for the episode came from Echo Finch, Epidemic Sounds, and Blue Dot Sessions. And uh, thanks to our investor, Prelude Ventures. Prelude is a venture capital firm that partners with entrepreneurs to address climate change across energy, food, ag, transportation, logistics, materials, manufacturing, and advanced computing. And uh, hook us up with a little shout out on social media or rating and review and send the link to this episode or our other back catalog episodes to a colleague or friend who might like it. I'm Stephen Lacey. This is The Carbon Copy. Thank you for joining us. We'll talk to you next time. Mm-hmm.